Okay, let's go ahead and uh, begin. Note that attendees join the webinar in listen-only mode, meaning you've been muted. Uh, so we hope that uh, everyone has been keeping well. We know these are uh, challenging times for many, but perhaps a good time to do a webinar. So front row, we provide insurance and risk management consulting services for the entertainment industry. We operate out of seven offices across Canada and the US. Our senior account executives have 20 plus years of ex experience providing expertise wherever and whenever needed. Front Row specializes in providing insurance solutions for a number of sectors, including uh, the ones that you see listed here, of course, uh, documentaries, film and television, uh, live theater, music insurance, um, and the like. So I'm Grant Patton, Vice President of Marketing here, and I'll be your moderator uh, for this webinar. And so I have about eight years experience uh, in the insurance industry now. I worked previously at CSIO, which is an insurance industry member association, in a marketing role, and I joined Front Row uh, last year. I'm a graduate of Ryerson and U of T. Damien Schleifer, Executive Vice President, specializes in developing insurance products and finding solutions for entertainment-related industries. Experiences include risk management consulting to film and television production companies, including animation and commercial production. Damien holds his BA from York University, his MA from Wilfrid Laurier University, and his CIP Chartered Insurance Professional Certification. With over 20 years of, ex of experience providing a wide range of insurance solutions, Damien is a reliable, knowledgeable professional who crafts together the best possible coverage. And Diane Konechny, Vice President, uh, Executive Vice President and Toronto Branch Manager, uh, began her insurance career working in claims and then moved over to being a broker in 1994. At that time, she was doing commercial insurance for several large insurance brokers. In 99, she began working for Jones Brown, focusing on insurance for the entertainment industry. Diane had a passion for the industry and had studied film and television in school. Diane moved over to Front Row when the entertainment division of Jones Brown joined with Focus Insurance. She continues to focus on providing policies for large and small productions and any entertainment related uh, industries. So here is uh, an overview of today's webinar. And so we will, uh, of course, go into introductory stuff like why, why film insurance is important in the first place. And then we will discuss a bunch of different film insurance related coverages. And um, of course, we will address the, uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak, of uh, COVID-19 um, and uh, film insurance considerations around that. Uh, toward the end of the webinar, and there will be some time for questions um, at the end. So the information provided in this webinar is to be used as a general reference only and is not intended as advice for any particular situation. In all cases, actual coverage is subject to policy language, terms and conditions of the long-form policy documents issued by the insurance companies. And so with that, I'll let uh, Damien and Diane uh, take over. All right, thank you, Grant. Um, the first uh, slide that we're going to look at um, starts off with sort of a very elementary question. Why is, is uh, film production insurance necessary? So there are a few reasons. Um, you know, our primary reason is uh, insurance provides um, uh, peace of mind, security for investors in a film. So, uh, you know, funders will put in a certain amount of money. They'll want to know that uh, there is uh, an insurance company with the means and ability to uh, pay for extra costs that arise out of something unforeseen. So on, on this slide, we have a picture of a boat that's uh, capsized and sinking. And uh, we've certainly uh, seen that exact type of claim <laughs> on a production and all sorts of other things that literally can happen out of the blue and are truly unexpected. Uh, so a delay to production can be very costly. Uh, claims process is quite stressful, uh, but at least if there is insurance, um, 
available to cover the actual damage to property and to cover your additional costs to get up and going again. Very important consideration. Uh, so not only providing peace of mind to your funders that that uh, coverage is in place and protection is there for their investment, uh, it does pr protect the, uh, the producer and the, the crew uh, as well uh, because there is some uh, safeguards and guarantee for their employment um, if something happens uh, and there's overruns or uh, the production's in such a serious state that they might not be able to continue. Uh, also, it provides protection for the public in terms of liability insurance. Uh, if something accidental and unforeseen happens to another party, that the insurance company, that the production company is responsible for, if there's a lawsuit against the production company, there is uh, definitely some protection there. So, uh, you know, in, in those examples that I've discussed, um, we've talked about contractual reasons uh, with funders, investors, um, and also about legal reasons uh, in case there's um, a location that requires um, insurance or there's some damage or an injury that the production is responsible for. And um, uh, the property, as I was alluding to as well, um, protects uh, the producer and the production company itself because there's security for the assets. Hi, everyone. Um, so one of the questions that we usually get from, from any kind of production um, is how are you going to budget for your premium? Um, a lot of people like to think that there is a you know certain percentage of the budget or other factors that um, will determine what the premium is. Um, but some basic things that the insurance companies look at in order to determine the pricing um, is the type of production. So again, documentary, feature film, uh, TV series, um, or even web content. Uh, there's a rate that's applied to the budget to come up with a basic number. Uh, for those types of things. And then, you know, the pricing could change depending on if there's any stunts or special effects, hazardous activities, um, if there's use of boats, planes, trains, um, anything in the water. So um, if there is scuba diving or any kind of risk factor like that, or even on boats, filming with equipment can be hazardous. Um, as I said, if there's aerial work, um, be it a drone, or if there is a helicopter or any other work, and then also there's other things, like if you're filming outside Canada in the US, um, there's specific policies that might be need to be looked at if there is um, certain requirements in another country for other policy types, or even the risk factor is a little bit higher, even if you're just going on your own and have the regular coverages, um, just because there's travel involved and there's more movement, so there's a greater risk for things like equipment, um, you know, that's been traveling and that can get damaged. So, you know, there's no, as, as I mentioned, there's no percentage really of budget that can determine the pricing. Um, but as, you know, many of you that have worked with us, if you have something you're budgeting for, you can always call us and give us an idea of what you're doing and we can give you some rough numbers to put in the budget before we get formal quotes. Branch, are you able to change to the next screen? Sorry. Yeah. And um, one type of entertainment package policy that's very common um, is a DICE policy. So DICE policy is intended to cover documentaries, uh, corporate videos, commercials, educational films, um, music videos uh, has been uh, more recently been extended to cover um, online content and other types of uh, productions. There, there can be some customization as to the type of projects that ICE policy covers, uh, but the, you know, the summary provided there is the sort of the, the essential skeleton of, of, of the policy. Uh, so the, the slide shows some typical coverages that are included in a DICE package. Uh, so that includes rented equipment, prop sets, wardrobe, um, 
extra expense coverage, uh, which pays for extra costs due to an interruption to the production because of damage to property or a set. Um, third party property damage uh, would cover damage to the production companies responsible for at a, a filming location. Uh, office contents, money securities, um, vehicle damage. The policy can also be uh, extended to include coverage for loss or damage to footage. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on, on the next slide about uh, negative and faulty coverage. Um, and the advantage of this pol type of policy is it's normally issued for a full year, so a full 12 month period, and provided the productions fit within the, the type of productions and the budget size agreed to with the insurance company. Um, there are a few other parameters too about you know countries you're filming in, type of countries, um, they're all complicated stunts, that type of thing. Uh, the coverage is automatic, uh, so it's very useful for uh, especially uh, producers for TV commercials or online commercials um, that they can just sort of kind of go from job to job and bid reliably knowing that they have coverage in place that's automatically there. Okay, I think we can move to the next slide, Grant, please. So one of the coverages that Damien mentioned in the DICE policy, oh, or, or on the equipment, or on the DICE policy, the equipment coverage as well. Um, so the equipment coverage is on, on the DICE as mentioned, and it's also on this, the free, um, the pro project specific uh, production policies. And the equipment coverage provides coverage for the camera equipment, um, any sound lighting, um, any grip equipment, basically anything, any equipment that's used in the process of filming the production. Um, one of the things that we kind of get asked on the, when applying for insurance is what limit of insurance should be put in for the equipment coverage. Now, it should be a limit that's sufficient to cover all the replacement costs of all the equipment on the production, not just from one supplier. Um, certain suppliers will have a certain required limit that they want uh, you to insure for, but it may not be sufficient to cover everything from all rental houses or anything that you might own. Um, just, you know, there's no specific rate applied to equipment insurance. So if you put a number that's lower, it's not going to change your premium. Um, the only effect that a higher limit of equipment might have is a deductible. Um, but again, you don't want to be left with an insufficient um, limit if you have rented equipment from multiple uh, suppliers. So, you know, there's there's definitely no benefit for undercutting the limit on, on something like that. Um, and most equipment rental houses will include in their contracts that you have to fully insure the equipment when it's in your possession. Uh, sometimes when it's being, you know, transported to and from locations. Um, and if you are renting gear or have a uh, DP coming into the production that has their own equipment, you want to make sure that if you're, it's your intent to actually cover the equipment that the, that person is using on the production that they might own themselves, it has to be in the contract with the individual to make sure that the insurance company would actually cover it. So they'll look, if there's a claim, they'll look for your legal obligation to provide the coverage. Um, so again, if your intent is to cover it, then you want to make sure it's in the contract. If you feel that the DP should be responsible for their own gear when they're using it on a production, then you know there shouldn't be anything and you should check your contracts to make sure that they didn't put that in. Um, one, uh, one insurer right now covers vehicles under equipment. So it should be taken into account when you're renting vehicles. It would be the damage to the vehicle that's covered under the equipment limit. So again, it should be sufficient enough to cover um, you know, any damage to a vehicle as well. Uh, typically on our applications, we have it separated out just because it's just one insurer doing that right now. Um, so we will increase the equipment limit on the proposals that we provide you with that specific insurance companies just so that your, your limits are sufficient. All right, Grant, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, the next coverage is prop sets and wardrobe. So it's, it's quite straightforward. It sounds exactly like what it's supposed to cover. 
Um, so any scenery, costumes, props, um, sets used in the production, uh, you know, these can include uh, rented items as well as items that are owned by production. Um, prop sets wardrobe coverage usually includes some coverage um, for watercraft, uh, railway equipment, uh, aircraft, uh, antiques, and artwork. Um, so while these co coverage might be included for these things, it's usually at a very small sublimit. So a smaller amount could be $25,000 or $10,000, if uh, or it could be a higher amount depending on the policy. So it's important to kind of look at this. And normally, when we provide quotes, we do itemize and list uh, what the sublimits are, so that you can take a look. And we do ask if you use any of these um, uh, items um, on a production, just so that we make sure we can adjust the the limit of insurance needed for them. Um, there's also um, uh, a lot of production companies will issue certificates or ask us to issue certificates to owners uh, of props uh, or wardrobe, for example. And it's important to note that the policy um, covers your legal liability. So if there's some contractual agreement or um, you know, agreement between you and the supplier that the production company is supposed to be responsible for insuring them. Um, and that's important to, to clarify, and that's what a claims adjuster looks at. They're not necessarily looking uh, as to whether you issued an insurance certificate or not, showing that the certificate really just shows that you have insurance coverage. It doesn't obligate you or make you responsible. So the, it's a, usually a contractual requirement, and a lot of suppliers will have that as part of their invoice or their, 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 their terms or their contract that they provide to you. All right, so the next coverage we want to talk about is negative film and videotape. Um, it's a bit of old terminology that the insurance companies use. So basically, it's covering any media, production media that you uh, use to create your production, <clears throat> excuse me, and it ensures any extra expenses caused by the loss or damage to that production media. Um, so it can be anything from, you know, it, it being damaged, um, you know, somewhere in the course of production. Um, we've had cases stolen with um, footage that's in it. Now, this is obviously, um, you know, easier to to kind of safeguard for yourselves because most of it's digital and can be backed up quite easily. Um, so the insurance company, um, you know, will look for questions or to question you on whether or not, um, you know, things are being backed up, um, you know, to different locations to safeguard it. Um, it will also cover film if anybody's covering or shooting on film. Uh, one of the things that if, you know, if anybody ch chooses to still do that is there is an accumulation warranty on it. So basically the film usually can't be accumulated for more than five shooting days or seven consecutive days, whichever is less. Um, if someone's using film in a remote location where that's not possible, um, longer periods can be provided. It just depends on the situation. Um, insurers also have uh, special conditions on how media is shipped and stored when shooting outside Canada and the U.S. Um, again, if it can be sent digitally, um, you know, obviously that's the best case scenario because then there's a, a copy. But if uh, if not, they look for the footage to actually be copied to different locations and, you know, potentially shipped back um, by, you know, one individual is shipped out by courier and then another separate one kept by someone else and um, taken back or um, or shipped back, uh, you know, at a, at a different time, just so not everything could be lost at once. Uh, I can yeah, take then, the, Go ahead. You want to take the next one? That's okay. okay go ahead. Uh, the, the next coverage is uh, faulty stock uh, camera processing. Uh, so this covers, um, it this covers uh, damage to footage. Um, it's caused by uh, faulty stock, so that could be um, it could be memory cards, it could be tapes, it could be uh, hard drive, uh, the camera itself if it's not operating properly, uh, or uh, the post production. Um, it could include people handling or, or, or working on footage. Uh, we've seen a number of claims for accidental erasure of footage. Um, in, in, 
with negative exposure to light, obviously uh, with processing before um, you have uh, good prints that are that are complete to work on. And um, uh, with digital, we've seen less claims in this area, but we still get them from time to time. Um, and often it's a problem with the camera uh, or with the stock is the main issue these days. Um, there is a condition under the policy that all of the equipment has to be fully tested and proved to be in sound um, condition prior to working with, with the equipment. And that's just to make sure and avoid a situation where you start shooting and you've got two or three days accumulated of footage and there was something wrong with the camera or with the stock and you just didn't notice until you blow up the footage on a, on a larger screen to look at uh, some issues. So um, most uh, most camera operators, most directors, um, directors of photography all sort of know and there are sort of standard things that you do to test the camera equipment. Uh, don't always rely on the equipment provider or equipment rental house. Uh, you should make sure and do your own testing and just uh, make note of the results and when the tests were done in case there is a claim that's a, an answer that's easy to provide to an insurance adjuster. And we can move to the next slide. The next up, we're going to talk about third-party property damage liability. Um, I'll just start on that while Grant gets to the next slide. Um, so basically, this picture is one of, obviously, if you can see it, a scratch on someone's floor. Um, this is something that, you know, we see a lot of claims on uh, when there's a production going into a house um, or other locations, you know, moving around equipment, heavy equipment can cause this. Or in some cases, we've seen um, on a film shoot, if the actors or actresses, well, mostly actresses, but um, in some cases, actors might be wearing heels. Um, so they can actually cause little holes in the floor if the floors are soft. Um, so we've, we've seen a lot of claims in those instances where this happens. So uh, this kind of damage to a property would be covered under the third property property third party property damage liability, sorry. Um, so this ensures um, you know, all the costs you're legally ob obligated to pay because of loss or destruction to property of others. And the thing to remember is that this is when you cause damage to things, to property that is in your care, custody or control. So this wouldn't be if you're on a location where the public is there. Um, so if you're shooting on a street or in a shopping mall, um, you know, that location is not thought to be in your care or custody control. This would be if you're renting a house um, or another building or a studio that you basically are in control of. Um, and, you know, it also doesn't cover, it doesn't cover things like prop set wardrobe equipment. There's kind of like a misunderstanding just because it says third party property. So um, we think of property as actual physical things like your equipment and props. Um, but this case, it's actual a physical property oh. itself, so a building. Um, so it doesn't cover any of the things that's outlined here. Um, one of the things it can extend to cover, though, is uh, legal liability for injury to animals. So if you have any animals that are, you ha are working with on a production, um, again, that you're responsible for, it can extend to cover those things. Uh, there are other coverages for animals, but this is just one area that um, can apply to, to injury to them. Uh, death would be covered under animal mortality coverage, which is something a little different. And another thing that it can do is extend to buildings and contents if you are renting a hotel suite or condo buildings or, or houses for individuals for the cast and crew. So a lot of times, obviously, if you're out of town, uh, you have a lot of people staying in different locations and, you know, unfortunately we have seen some instances where people had a really good night after a day of shooting and have caused them damage. So this can be extended to pick those things up as well. The next coverage is extra expense coverage. And extra expense coverage um, will cover the production company for additional costs. Um, there are costs above what was originally budgeted due to an interruption, postponement, or cancellation of the production. If there's damage um, 
to uh, equipment or facilities that you're using um, in connection with the production. So typically it would be a set or a location for filming um, or camera equipment. If camera equipment is damaged and uh, it takes a few days to get a replacement uh, equipment in, uh, that's sort of the in-between time. Uh, you can be incurring additional costs if you have to pay staff, um, look, uh, keep people in hotels if you're at a remote location. Um, a number of other things can be sort of included there, as provided they stem from the, the damage uh, and delay to the production. It has to be actual physical damage to the property um, in order to trigger the coverage. And uh, there are some extensions that can be uh, added to this coverage for civil authority, mechanical breakdown um, of camera equipment, and also disruption of power or strike by um, union members that are not uh, party to the entertainment industry. So no guilds or this would be if you're filming at a location, for example, and city workers go on strike and you don't have access to the uh, the, the location that you were scheduled to film at. We can move to the next slide. So uh, the next slide is office contents, and this just seems to be a fairly messy office, but um, it will cover things like your desks, um, any kind of computer equipment that you're using, and any other contents. It also includes some coverage for any tenants improvements. Um, that you might have done on your office. Um, and the one thing to, to keep in mind when doing this is that coverage includes the loss of use of property, um, the loss of use of property of others, um, which you're legally liable. So again, in the same case as equipment, um, you know, there's usually a contractual requirement if it's not something you own, if it's, your, if it's something you're renting. Uh, it would need to be in the contract with the individuals you're renting the equipment from. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, whether it's under a DICE policy or the single purpose uh, production company's policy, um, the office contents are only covered when being used on an insured production. So if you have finished production, your post is complete and you still have an office space uh, that you have in the name of that production company, um, even if your policy is in place and you're not working on that, if you're not working on that production anymore, the policy uh, typically would not respond. So that's when you should be looking at a separate property policy to cover off the office uh, requirements. A lot of times, um, again, if you're having a long-term lease with uh, a building owner or property manager, they're going to have certain requirements in the lease. Uh, that typically aren't responded to under an office contents or under the office contents portion of a DICE or a production policy. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have the proper coverages. So if you are moving into an office space, you can always send us the insurance provisions in the lease and we can take a look at it to make sure you're properly covered um, so that there's uh, no gaps in coverage. Um, one thing we're asked about and that there always seems to be concern about is if crews or employees bring their own laptops or other equipment to use on the production. Um, so again, in the case of the office contents and the equipment that I mentioned, um, you know, there's not coverage under the insurance policy unless there is something in writing between the production company and that individual making the production company responsible for it. Um, and in the case of laptops, it's something obviously that um, you know, is of concern because laptops are easily picked up and taken out and, um, you know, by third parties, anybody walking into the office space um, and the deductibles on laptops are quite uh, high under the insurance policies. Normally, they're starting about $2,500. Uh, so if you're making the production company responsible, that would be something the production company is going to have to pay uh, to the insurance company or to the individual if they replace their equipment. So something to keep in mind um, when you're agreeing or not agreeing to provide the coverage. Uh, the next coverage is uh, coverage for money and securities. And uh, less and less productions or um, less likely to, that productions will use uh, actual cash um, but uh, it still happens from time to time, especially productions that might be traveling 
going out of country or to remote locations or just needing um, certain per diems and, and miscellaneous costs uh, that they need to, to cover. So the policy will cover theft of money and securities and um, this the standard coverage does not include theft by employees. So that's an important thing to know. This is uh, really intended for people uh, who might break into your premises and take money, or we've seen uh, a number of, of uh, claims where production personnel have actually gone out to purchase supplies uh, or items from the production, taking cash with them, uh, had their entire wallet and the cash stolen, um, or they were traveling and had uh, cash stolen at an airport. So that's uh, uh, a coverage that you know, we don't see as many claims for uh, anymore because a lot of money is just done electronically or with credit card or prepaid. But um, for certain production, certain circumstances, still very important coverage. So this is something I'm sure all of you have seen and um, you know we've seen a lot of is uh, damage to vehicles and that is again something that's covered under our policies. Um, so the commercial vehicle physical damage um, as I said is either a separate coverage under the policy or as I mentioned um, can be covered under the equipment coverage depending on the insurer. Um, and what this insures is actual physical damage to a vehicle um, that's hired by production and used on the production. So, um, you know, again, these have to be rented in the name of the production company. If you have a corporate policy that you potentially are renting, you know, uh, or have a deal with um, with a certain rental company, we just want to make sure that the named insured on the policy also rent also matches the rental agreement with the, uh, the rental company that you're getting the vehicles from. Um, there's always a lot of confusion about how vehicles are covered and you know it depends on from province to province because auto insurance is regulated by the provincial governments um, so these policies will cover the damage to the vehicle but auto liability which is a separate coverage um, you know which covers off if you're sued in relation to injury to another party or for accident benefits um, you know if someone actually gets injured that's driving the vehicle um, so there is uh, a article that we have on our on our website uh, that breaks out it province by province. Um, you know, for those in BC, it's covered by the government, so it comes with your plate. In Ontario, um, there are separate auto liability policies that are required if you're renting vehicles for more than 30 days. Um, you know, again, it's a, it's it's sold by insurers, not by the government in Ontario. Um, in Quebec, it's different. Um, certain portions are government, certain portions are um, sold by private insurers. So you need to check out what the requirements are. And obviously, it's something that we can help you with when you are purchasing a policy with us. Um, one of the things to remember is that if uh, you are getting vehicles and they are rented for more than 30 consecutive days, uh, then the auto liability policy would likely be required because there is certain restrictions under the commercial general liability policy, which has some auto coverage in it. Um, so again, you know, just ask when you are looking to buy your policy to see if that's required. Uh, some things that are excluded under the policy when um, for rented vehicles, and that's stunt and precision driving. Um, in some instances, we can get coverage for it. It may be subject to an additional cost or a higher deductible, depending on the situation and how it's um, how it's being played out. Uh, we need to know the details of the activity um, and you know who's driving the vehicle, their experience, and those types of things to look at removing the exclusion with the insurer. Uh, one question we get a lot is: Is there an age restriction for a driver on a vehicle? We know a lot of productions will hire people that are in their early 20s and um, you know the rental companies are the ones that actually have the restriction for the age of the driver so that's something that should be checked with the rental companies that you're getting your vehicles from um, typically they have a restriction of 21 or 25 depending on the rental company um, obviously we want everybody to have a valid driver's license when they are given vehicles 
Um, and some production companies actually now are looking for a motor vehicle reporter, and it's called an MVR, um, on certain drivers or on the drivers used on production, uh, just because it's it's an area where there's lots of claims that happen. Um, and even though there is insurance coverage for it, the deductibles will range from you know $2,500 up to a maximum usually of $10,000 if something is total, because there's a, usually a percentage of 10% of the loss. So if you have multiple accidents on one production, you know, it could be a lot of money under, out of the production company's budget just paying the deductibles on those. So again, you can look to ask for, you know, an operator's record to, to determine whether you want them driving a vehicle. Um, and of course, the the production company has to comply with the, you know, whatever the rental company has in their contract in terms of who's allowed to drive the vehicle. Uh, the next coverage we're going to talk about is commercial general liability. And this is actually a separate policy, separate to the entertainment package, um, but uh, very important and, and almost always purchased uh, together with the entertainment package. It ensures the policyholder, the production company, um, if they're legally obligated for injuries or damage to other parties. So if um, production personnel are responsible for causing an injury or damage to someone else, um, this is the policy that would pay any sorts of claims um, brought against the production company, and the policy would include uh, coverage for uh, legal defense costs, so the cost to pay for a lawyer. There's no proceeds or no, no money that's paid directly to the production company. This would be for third parties um, and legal costs. So it's a little bit different to the entertainment package, um, which is a little bit easier to understand in the sense of, okay, you've got some property, it gets damaged, how do we get the damage uh, repaired or replaced? Um, with the commercial general liability policy, there's usually very little coverage or no coverage when you're using automobiles, aircraft, watercraft, or uh, snow, snow machines, snow vehicles. So if you're using any of these, um, uh, can we call them conveyances or types of uh, equipment, uh, it, it's best to talk to the broker because in certain cases there are specialized policies or coverage that's available to cover your liability if you're operating any of these. And on the previous slide, Diane talked a lot about automobiles. Uh, we do have another slide coming up which we'll talk about automobiles that are rented short term. There is a little bit of coverage that uh, is often added to a commercial general liability for non-owned autos. Uh, so we'll, we'll cover that on a separate slide. Um, most uh, commercial general liability policies apply on a worldwide basis, but only for suits that are brought forth within Canada and the US. So while that sounds very good, um, if you are filming internationally outside of North America, uh, it's important to consider um, looking at um, uh, adding uh, separate coverage to your commercial general liability policy to broaden it, to respond to claims that are made internationally. So if you're filming in France, something happens in France, and you're sued in France, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you have coverage that's uh, uh, more broad than just uh, suits brought forth in Canada and the U.S. And um, there are uh, there are options available to cover that uh, through an international indemnity clause that we add to the liability, liability policy. So if the insurer is unable to represent you in that foreign country, uh, they will consult with you to um, get a defense in that country and to pay for your legal defense costs there. Yeah, I think we can move to the next slide. Yeah. All right. As we talked about, um, the liability policy has a non-owned auto portion to it. Um, I'm going to go over this quickly just because we need to want to leave some time for questions. But um, as I mentioned, it there, this is part of the general liability coverage um, and it covers short-term rentals, so any vehicles that are rented for under 30 consecutive days. Um, so it'll provide for any liability imposed by law for the individual for the company that um, has rented the vehicle for bodily injury or death of a person or damage to property of others. So 
if someone drives into um, a building, we've had trucks back into loading docks and, you know, they're not, um, they don't quite fit, let's say. And so there's damage to the, to the structure of the, the loading dock. Um, so that would be covered under the non-owned auto liability portion. Uh, one thing to remember is that if you are using a employee's vehicle, they still need to keep their primary auto insurance. It's not like they can, um, you know, cancel their insurance because they're getting insured under your policy. You want to make sure that, uh, you know, all their coverages are still intact. Um, just because it, it doesn't replace the auto policy that they have. Uh, just like when you're renting a vehicle from a rental company, they still have their own auto policy because uh, it's not necessarily protecting you in the same way that a, a, a primary auto policy would. Um, and one thing also to remember is this coverage only applies within Canada and the U.S. Uh, so if you are renting vehicles in another country, it'd be something that you need to look at from the rental companies that you're getting them from um, to to buy the additional coverage or look at additional coverage from the rental company when, when there. Yeah, a way to uh, that's convenient to increase the limit of insurance or the, the amount of coverage that you have for commercial general liability is to look at an umbrella or an excess liability policy. And, um, you know, this will cover um, the same sorts of things that a commercial general liability policy would, but just allows you to carry a much higher limit of insurance. And um, umbrella sometimes has slightly broader um, conditions uh, or coverage than a commercial general liability. Uh, and the excess tends to be just a, a, a very simple way of increasing your limit. So if you were to purchase a 1 million commercial general liability policy, an excess uh, or umbrella policy would allow you to um, uh, top that up to a much higher limit. Uh, an umbrella is preferable in, in many ways because you can also top up coverage for other types of policies under an umbrella. So like an umbrella, it'll shelter you and then uh, some other coverages that you might have, the commercial general liability, if you have your own primary auto insurance um, and third party property damage coverage. So uh, the umbrella has a, a nice feature. You're buying one policy, but it really increases the limits on a few different policies for you for the same price. So a lot of productions that may need 5 million, 10 million, 15 million, or we even see 25 million sometimes, uh, the umbrella is, is uh, the, the best and kind of easiest way to, to increase that liability protection. All right, so more auto. So if you are renting vehicles for more than 30 days, um, so they'd be not be covered out um, in the commercial general liability non-own auto portion, um, you'd need to be looking at a primary auto policy. Um, so this covers you the same way. Uh, it covers um, for any legal liability arising out of the use of the car um, for, for and for it can include owned automobiles also now owned being owned by the production company as opposed to um, owned by individuals that are working on the production. Um, and as mentioned, it's all provincially regulated. So it's uh, you need to look at your own um, province to see where the auto insurance is available, either from private insurers or through the government. Um, and again, it's something that we can uh, help out with and let you know whether you need that coverage. Um, you know, here there's some things outlined on the slide in terms of the provincial requirements. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're buying a primary auto policy and you actually um, are looking for us to quote it, which we can as part of the whole production package that you would be looking at. Um, the cost of the primary auto policy comes from the budget, and we look at the transport portion of the budget and split out what is production vehicles, what are, um, you know, commercial vehicles that basically, um, you know, might just be sitting on set and moving around occasionally. So they're rated differently than a vehicle that's, uh, you know, basically running around from location to location, picking things up or, or running different errands. So that's where we come up with the, the numbers to actually quote out that policy. Um, and again, if 
you are renting the vehicle in Canada, and again, it's the province, so it's wherever the vehicle is plated itself, not what necessarily what uh, province you're actually shooting in. So it's where it's plated. Um, but when you have the policy, it covers you within Canada and the U.S. only. So, you know, vehicles can't be shipped anywhere else for um, other work in different countries, but it's not what, something we run into very often, if at all. All right, so I think shooting outside Canada, Damien, you can take that one. Yeah, sure. There's um, uh, a lot of different types of insurance that you can purchase when you're filming outside of Canada and the, and the United States. Um, uh, the, the policies are written, uh, the standard policies are written to contemplate most exposures when you're in Canada and the U.S., but when you're when you're traveling out of country, you know, some of the most obvious things to think about would be out of country medical. Um, if you're eligible for government health insurance um, or uh, for U.S. citizens, if they have uh, health insurance, it may apply only while they're in their state or within the U.S. and have very limited coverage for travel. Uh, you want to make sure and purchase that coverage um, prior to departure. Um, Right now and in the, the near future, um, with COVID-19, there are a lot of um, travel policies that will not respond or cover. Um, you know, claims are arising out of COVID-19 because they uh, consider this to be an existing, uh, existing um, not fortuitous situation, or a lot of countries still have travel advisories that could limit um, travel and medical insurance. So. Prior to departure, it's a good thing to really understand what you're purchasing. Online uh, products are you know, numerous and very and available and easy to get, uh, but you really wanna make sure that you read the wording first so that you fully understand or you know, use a, a travel agent or an insurance broker to give you some guidance because travel agents, insurance brokers also sell that coverage. Um, accidental death, if, uh, people are working in sort of hazardous conditions or locations might be a consideration. We can pay a benefit benefit to the um, the estate or the next of kin. Uh, we do get productions that film in war torn areas, and uh, sometimes war risks can be extended both on a travel policy for emergency medical, but also for property for your equipment and uh, production insurance. So those are uh, considerations if you're traveling out of country. Uh, there's other things like uh, foreign um, excess auto, difference in conditions. So this really just tops up whatever the rental agency provides in the foreign country to sort of the standards um, that you would get in Canada uh, up to a, a limit of about a million dollars normally. Uh, foreign voluntary workers compensation. So it's not intended to replace Compuls legally compulsory workers' compensation insurance, but um, it does give a, a producer or policyholder a lot of control as to who they can cover for this coverage. It applies on a 24-hour basis, not just during strictly working hours. And um, for any U.S. hire, it's very important uh, to have U.S. workers' compensation, and uh, that can be purchased um, through an insurance broker, if you have a federal employer identification number and are registered in the U.S., or uh, through a payroll service company, it's, it's usually the most common and easiest way of getting that coverage. Um, and then some countries have other specific mandatory coverages. So, you know, depending on where you're going, we might suggest different coverages, or maybe even suggest uh, obtaining some local coverage from one of our partner brokers that we work with. Um, so that's uh, um, kind of some of the things that you can think of. There's a host of other things, but, um, you know, depending on your location, where you're going, uh, again, uh, easy for us to give you some recommendations and things to think about. Okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, so we're going to talk a bit about E&O insurance. Um, I'm sure all of you have run into the need for E&O insurance and have a basic understanding of, of what it covers, but we'll just kind of go over some of it. Um, so it'll cover you off for libel, slander, defamation of character, copyright infringement, 
uh, invasion or infringement of the right of privacy, plagiarism, piracy, uh, breach of contract, basically anything that we have listed here. Um, so if it's alleged that you had, uh, you know, had any of these issues on your production, uh, the insurance policy will respond to it and will cover the legal expenses incurred in the defense of the claim itself. Um, usually what we see when an e and issue comes up, um, you know, not as many of them go to court as, at least in Canada, um, as, as, you know, they might in the U.S., but uh, the legal expenses that are incurred um, are usually quite significant. So, you know, it, it provides some good protection there um, and provides the, you know, the expertise by the individuals at the other insurance company or their legal uh, companies that they deal with. So it can provide a defense on that. Um, we have some other information about it. So uh, Grant, if you can go to the next slide, I can take this one as well, Damien, and then um, sure. to the next. Um, so some of the things that the broadcasters are looking for and which producers will need is title coverage. Um, so in order to obtain title coverage on the production itself, there's a title report that's required. Um, in the majority of cases, in order to get worldwide coverage, um, all you need is a U.S. and Canada a Canadian title search from white, one of the um, companies that, that provide them. If you are changing the title into a different language, um, then there might be a title report required from that specific country where they, um, you know, where it's being broadcast in that language. So um, it's one thing to remember that if the title stays the same, that's fine, but if there is some change in it, a separate title report might be required in order to clear that alternate title. Um, and I'm sure as all of you have seen, the broadcasters, funders, bonders, distributors, basically anybody who's picking up that production to disseminate it in some way or sell it um, to other areas, they will require e and coverage to be in place and to have them added as an additional insured. Basically, what it's doing is protecting those individuals or those companies rather um, in case they are named in a lawsuit with respect to something that could result in an E&O claim. Um, the e &O requires legal clearance, so the producer will have to have their own legal clearance. And for most cases, the insurance company has their own legal clearance and the two need to go through the application and also decide, um, or sorry, to go through the questions to make sure all the clearances and releases and everything have been done as required. Um, the, the question that we get a lot on EO is when to put it in place. Um, that's usually dictated by the broadcasters or funders. Um, they will have it in their contracts basically stating when they want the coverage to be in place, how long it needs to be in place for, and the limits that they want. Um, and sometimes they'll also, if it's from, you know, the U.S. or from some other areas, um, they'll ask for the certain type of, you know, policy to, to be put in place. So either a claims made or an occurrence based policy. Uh, so if it's something that uh, you're trying to determine for your budgeting purposes in terms of what is required on the, you know, um, it, you should look at the contracts uh, to see what you're going to need. Um, obviously, higher limits will require, will have rather a higher price to them. Uh, longer terms of coverage will also have a difference in price from, you know, if something's required for one year or two years. Uh, normally, we see most companies looking for coverage in excess of six years if it's a claims made policy. Um, there's lots of digital components that are now being added to productions, um, which don't necessarily fall into the standard uh, you know, coverage. So think bonus material, different websites, any interactive sites um, or any other companion material aren't automatically included. Details on those also need to be provided. Um, most of the times there's a supplemental application that needs to be completed in order to get those cleared as well. Um, and just, you know, that insurance companies can provide coverage for E&O up to a maximum of eight years. Um, you know, there are some funders or broadcasters that look for longer terms now, <clears throat> but that's the maximum they can do at any one time. 
Um, we have seen, um, you know, over the years, and it's probably happening more now with more social media, no, more advertising being accessible to individuals all around, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, claims come in prior to the actual um, production airing. Um, so, you know, we do recommend that coverage be put in place prior to principal photography um, or any advertising that's being done, just so that there is coverage in place um, before any word gets out about what's being done. Even if there's talk about a production that's being picked up, you know, we see allegations that, you know, um, you know, an individual said that they came to the production company or someone who's been hired by the production company with an idea and that idea for that film or documentary or, or whatever it might be was theirs initially and it was being stolen by the individual that you hired or it had been sent to you years ago as an idea. So, you know, again, nothing might come out of that. It might be completely false, but there are legal expenses that are gonna need to be incurred in order to defend that. So if you have the coverage in place, um, you know, then the insurance company can defend you in that situation. Just of time, we're going to have to skip to this slide, uh, Diane. Sure. <clears throat> um, so I know a lot of you have been wondering what the what the insurance response to COVID is and what the industry is going to look like. Um, going into the future. Um, one thing we want to preface this information with is this is the situation as it stands now with the insurance companies. Um, you know, it has changed several times from, you know, the beginning of March when this started to become a bigger concern uh, for all of us um, in, you know, in our work lives in terms of filming or any other work that's being done and also in our personal lives. So, you know, we can't say that everything that is outlined here is going to be the same instance in you know a week from now or a month from now or even a year from now so obviously everything's going to change as um you know as different things happen um with hopefully a vaccine at some point uh definitely things will change um but as different things happen in the industry itself and you know in the different provinces and countries so Damien, do you want to take some of these? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're seeing a range of different exclusions coming from insurance companies. So some are excluding COVID-19 specifically and any sort of mutations of that, um, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. Other insurers are looking at uh, more broadly worded communicable disease exclusions. So thinking uh, ahead to the next sort of pandemic. Uh, they're looking to clarify that the coverage they intend on providing is for property insurance and not for, for pandemics or, or for government-ordered shutdowns of the broader economy. It's just uh, something they can't assess price for or probably sustain as an industry because the, the economic losses are so heavy. Um, so, uh, you know, other Companies are looking at changing deductibles, limiting coverage, um, increasing premiums. Uh, we've seen some insurers retreat and uh, decline to provide coverage to the film industry. Um, there's a lot of reorganization going on in the, within the insurance industry and, and looking at ways to deal with this. So uh, in, in our situation, we are really looking at and giving advice to clients on what to do in the near future in the absence of insurance, it's really working on good guidelines, uh, looking at government recommendations for keeping workplaces safe, uh, you know, including social distancing, increased uh, hygiene, sanitation. Um, you know, can you work in smaller groups, smaller uh, sets, or, or groups of people on location? There's a lot of recommendations and ideas that are coming up from different uh, stakeholders. And I think it's important to look at them to figure out what the best practices are going to be. And uh, we are actively looking at any and all insurance options, uh, including life insurance um, and different sort of ways to try and provide coverage. But right now it's, it's very early and uh, there is no 
uh, insurance company willing to provide coverage. So we are kind of limited from a coverage standpoint at the moment but to continue to kind of work with industry stakeholders to see what other options are available. Uh, if you have any specific questions on a production coming up, um, it's best to kind of start the discussion early with your broker and just sort of plan the best, uh, best approach for insurance coverage. Okay, I think we can move on, Grant, and turn it over to you. Yeah, so we have our uh, Film Insurance 101 book on Amazon, uh, Amazon.ca and Amazon.com in both uh, ebook and paperback formats. Uh, the ebook can be purchased for just 99 cents, the paperback just a few dollars more. Uh, the book covers a lot of the same content that you just heard in this webinar, but it also includes a lot of other information on different policies and coverages that we didn't discuss today. So feel free to check that out on Amazon. So there was a question from Arnold Lim. Um, e &O, um, your slide recommends coverage for E&O be in place prior to principal photography, but there may be paperwork that is simply not accessible before principal photography, perhaps new or unknown locations, changes in actors, crew being hired, et cetera. How does that affect E&O? Well, I can answer that. Um, a lot of times when, uh, an ENO application is sent in prior to principal. Um, you know, there are certain questions on the application in terms of releases or uh, license agreements or anything like that is there. Um, the questions will, in a lot of cases, allow for you to say that the releases haven't been obtained but will be obtained prior to broadcast. Or for things such as music, obviously, um, the music hasn't been either composed or all the music rights haven't been purchased. Uh, so what the insurance company will do is put an exclusion in place for music or if it's film clips or or certain situations so um and then at the point where those rights or licenses or or um you know compositions or anything has been completed and, and all the rights have been attained then it's just an, an email to us stating that the rights have been obtained and then we send it on to the insurance company and they'll remove that exclusion um so it's not excluding everything. Um, in some instances, if it's a controversial subject matter in a documentary or something, uh, the insurance companies might put on what's called a rough cut exclusion, meaning the lawyers need to review the rough cut prior to the insurance company um, pro providing full coverage on the production. Um, but in most cases, we see it with exclusions for clips and music and title. Um, and again, those can be easily removed once all the rights have been obtained. So you're getting some coverage, not everything, but it's usually the, you know, issue with, um, you know, the writers or, you know, the idea that comes at the beginning uh, of production or the advertising of production as opposed to, um, you know, music rights or film clip rights or something that can, you know, easily be obtained after um, you've continued with the production. Do you mean, I don't know if you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, um, some documentary producers feel, um, you know, it, it can be too early to purchase insurance because they're not going to be broadcast for a couple of years and they don't really know who they're going to interview. Those circumstances are, are a little bit different, but understandable. Scripted is much more straightforward. As soon as possible, you should get coverage and start to working with your lawyer on, on clearing rights. Uh, but some documentaries are a little bit more difficult. Um, still, if you can get even some preliminary coverage up front, uh, that would be ideal, um, and then finalize the rest uh, closer to post-production. Uh, but in those situations um, where you can't get uh, insurance so early on, you just really need to be uh, careful, uh, especially about publicity and, and um, certain rights that you mightn't have or could be alleged that you don't have especially if it's uh, a documentary about people or something contentious. Okay, so uh, that's that's all the time we have uh, for questions for today. Uh, any other questions that came in, we can contact you through email. Um, and, that, and our email is there on the slide, toffice at frontrowinsurance.com. Also, uh, consider following Front Row Insurance on Facebook and or Twitter. Uh, thanks to Damien and Diane for an informative presentation. And we also thank everyone for registering and attending the webinar. We hope you found it useful. 
Uh, the webinar has been recorded and a link to the recording will be made available on Front Row's YouTube channel within the next uh, few days. And assuming the feedback on this webinar is positive, we plan to do more webinars like this in the future. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, and so thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, stay well and have a good day.